Hello friends and welcome back to the Prince Armory Academy. In this tutorial, we'll be building this intricate leather helmet. In a previous video, I crafted the Elven Lord Helmet Core and covered some of the basics. And in this video, I'll be making the visor, the comb, and the tailpiece and bringing them all together to finish the helmet. This guide will demonstrate the build process and introduce you to some of the more advanced leather tooling and crafting techniques. The material I'm using here is 9 to 10 ounce Herman Oak Vegetable Tanned Leather. This is one of the more premium leather options which was selected for its tooling and molding capabilities. This leather and any other tools and materials you need for this build and more can be found at Weaver Leather Supply. Check the link in the description to browse their impressive online catalog and get some great deals for your next build. When tracing the patterns, I'm leaving a little bit more space than normal. Typically you want to be economical and pack the patterns as tightly as you can to reduce waste. But with projects heavy on tooling, this extra space will help prevent the leather from stretching out as much, and it will let you do some additional tooling and cutting techniques as well. So don't completely cut out the pieces at this stage, just separate them with a utility knife. Next I'll dip the leather into water to prepare them for carving and tooling. Wetting the leather is what allows it to become workable, which is where you can carve it, tool it, and shape it. When it dries, it will retain these details. Normally this stage is where you would cut everything out, but this project has a lot of complex shapes. So carving and tooling the entire piece first will give a cleaner look and make the final cuts much easier. This helmet features quite a bit of carving and tooling, and this video focuses mostly on the overall build. I will however include a few sections for context here. Next I'll start carving out all of the lines. Initially I did some test tooling on the outer area of the piece to determine the design I wanted. Use a compass or a wing divider to establish consistent border widths. You do not have to make a full perimeter around every piece. The patterns will give a good indication of where your border lines need to be. The way I like to approach this is to make a narrow border for the outer perimeter first. I'll freehand any internal points, and then carefully carve the guidelines. Then I'll make a slightly wider border within the last line which will enclose a band of repeating geometric pattern. Then carve that one too. There are many parts to tool, so I have two compasses set to different widths so I can stay consistent across all of the pieces. Then I'll make the last internal border to make another narrow band, just to frame up the tooling nicely. The tooling on many of the pieces of this armor will consist of a number of beveled borders, some internal tooling, and some texture. It's also great to transfer any design lines or rivet indicators at this stage too while the leather is damp and able to easily take an impression. Now I'll bevel both sides of each line. I'm using a wide smooth beveler that I made myself, but anything similar will work fine here. And be sure to take your time at this stage to save on cleanup time later. When you angle your piece so that the light glints off of your bevel lines, you want it to smoothly glisten. I'm probably making this look easier than it is, but take your time and go as slow as you need to. Get your lines clean and as regular as you can. Next I'm going to be adding some texture to the inner areas. For the broader texture, I'll start with the firm strike next to the border lines. I'm being careful not to overlap the tool with itself too much, because I want to preserve the thick chunky texture. Then I'll start a fade technique by hitting the next row with a softer strike, and eventually fade it out with very light taps. And here I'm adding a pebble texture to clean up the edges, and I like this tool because it has a flat spot that gets a nice crisp transition along the border edges. But any sort of pebble texture tool should work just fine. Now I'm filling out the middle beveled band with the scroll design that I picked out for the project. One downside of most repeatable geometric patterns is that they really don't like to be used on irregular twists and turns. For example, in corner areas, you can see that the flow is broken. So we have to get a little creative to camouflage the transitions. I'm using a large circular spot tool, which will end up looking like a false rivet or another decorative detail. When the tooling is complete, we can finally cut out the piece. Having previously carved and beveled the outer line, the cut is very easy. You don't have to worry as much about cutting straight because your cutting tool will just follow the groove. On this piece I'm using an edge skiving tool to knock off the sharp edges on all sides. And then burnish with a slicking tool. If you ever have trouble holding a small piece steady while tooling, you can always weigh it down with a heavy object. 
When I go to the texture stage, I'll be going more for an area fill here with a pebble tool. This will help pop the ornamental detail. Here I'm adding the scroll tooling again. Please be aware that I've spent months into building the advanced guides for our academy and there are hours of additional content in this series alone that will completely explain and demonstrate all the tooling techniques in detail. So if you haven't been to our academy yet or in a while, I would encourage you to check it out. These additional guides are included if you purchase the helmet pattern or the pattern bundle, but they're also available separately. To help make it look a bit more organic, I'll follow up with a swivel knife with semi-irregular cuts and nicks along the edges of each feather. Before we move on to coloring, my next task is to get all of the parts tooled and pre-assemble the helmet. I'll be starting with the tail section that sits at the back of the helmet. It's comprised of a few articulated segments that will allow it to collapse freely. Next, I'll need to do a test fit on the pieces and make sure everything lines up. There's a small retaining strap that connects the tail pieces along the center. I really like to use office brads for checking the fit and for temporary mock-ups. I'm lining up the piece along the center and marking the holes for attachment. There is some flexibility in positioning here, and you can adjust the angle of the tail depending on how you mount it here. Or just copy what I've done here if you like the default configuration. You'll notice that I keep the pieces slightly damp as I start the pre-assembly process. None of the pieces in this build, or most of my builds in general, are ever assembled plain and flat. They generally have some degree of shape to them. Since the helmet core is already assembled, it's much easier just to use a drill to make the holes. Now I'm clamping the base of the tail to the helmet, and I'm using scraps of leather to avoid deforming the surface of the damp leather. And you may note that I did not yet punch some of the holes for all of the pieces. This is because leather stretches a lot when being tooled and formed, and you may use a different thickness or type of leather than I will. So you should always verify fit first. You can typically mark and punch the hole placements on the overlapping piece first, and then make any fine tuning adjustments or even punch a new hole in a different spot on the piece beneath which will be hidden by the upper layer. The patterns for this project come with four pieces, and I omitted one piece in my build. Don't read into this too much. I just decided to go with three pieces instead of four for a slightly shorter tail. You may prefer the four-piece configuration. I'm adjusting a few hole placements to make this change, but if you're following along on your own build, you can just follow the patterns for the original layout. When you attach all of the pieces, they should be able to move and collapse a little, and if you prefer a different spread, you can change the hole placements in the retaining strap. Next, we'll put together the cone. I may also refer to this type of component as a crest. First, I'll carve and tool the pieces again. The tooling process is basically the same, so let's go ahead and put it together. The topmost piece that connects the sides of the cone together requires a compound curve. 
The leather will need to be damp but still firm. If it's too wet, you'll not be able to stretch the leather enough to make it hold shape, and it will turn out lumpy. And if it's too dry, it won't accept any stretch at all. Start by folding it into a U shape along the length of the piece. Then work this piece into a crescent shape while maintaining the previous bend. You can work it back and forth and press it against a flat surface to ensure the shape stays even. Just get it close to the shape of the side pieces. If you get close enough, the rivets will force the final shape. I would also strongly recommend skiving the inside of the side parts along the top. Here's debulking the material, which will make assembly much easier. Refreshing the moisture content will also relax the leather and make it less stubborn during assembly. I'm snapping the rivets into place along one side first. To set the rivets, I'm using the back end of a mini anvil. If you do not have something like this, you can improvise with another method. For example, if you can find a small metal piece that you can wedge between the pieces. You just need some way to support the back of the rivet so that you can set it. And if you have a foot press, that can work too. I'm planishing the leather with a smooth-faced hammer along the sides just to clean up any bacon edges, which is what I call the ripple effect of low spots left behind by rivets, or the irregular edges left behind from wet molding. The final step at this stage is to fine-tune the form of the crest so it fits snugly against the helmet core. When you finish your core, it may be slightly different in shape than mine. Just try to shape the crest so that it makes even contact, and you may prefer a wider or more narrow crest, so you do have some flexibility according to your own preference. You can shape the piece however you want. Line up the point of the crest with the point of the helmet core. Here again, it's more expedient just to drill out the hole placements. And finally, we'll work on the visor. I'll touch on some of the tooling here, but as I mentioned previously, it's a pretty big piece and there are a lot of tooling techniques. So if you want the full demonstration and additional content, I hope you'll consider grabbing the complete pattern and lesson bundle. The design on the faceplate has some filigree cutouts for a nice visual effect, which will also aid in airflow and heat dissipation. The visor has some optional filigree work, which if you want to replicate it, I'll cover it in more detail in the advanced cutting guide that will accompany the Elven projects. It'll also be available as a standalone lesson, but that's what you'll want to watch next if you're building the helmet. To begin the pre-assembly process for the visor, you can see I've taped together some of the pieces. The whole visor is designed to swing open on a pivot, and it's important to get the fit right here. The pattern will include some reference mark indicating the zone where the Chicago screws will go, but you will want to verify for yourself because again, with such a complex piece, and so much shaping, and so many parts, and so much tooling, and so many variables in your own leather, the shape of your helmet is going to vary slightly, and maybe more than slightly. The way I determined the correct fit in this prototype design was to use a stitching awl and stab through both layers at the pivot point. I did this on both sides. Fortunately, this area is covered by the decorative side plates on the visor, so on the underside at least, if you need to tweak things, you can relocate the whole location without anyone ever knowing.
The correct fit in this instance is where the faceplate would sit snugly against the front of the helmet core and still pivot smoothly over the comb. I'm lining up the bottom of the faceplate as shown here. To ensure symmetry, you can transfer the hole you made to the paper pattern and then use that to mirror the hole location to the other side. Here I'm doing some touch-ups on the helmet core. Trimming away the under bits will clean up the look, and planishing the front edge along the core and burnishing it will improve comfort. The faceplate has a small trim piece. The back is skived to remove bulk. To determine the position, I'll tape the piece in and then mark a reference line. I'm roughing the contact area which will be glued in a moment. I'll also rough the inside for good measure. Now I'll glue the trim piece. This is not a load-bearing piece. Any standard PVA or leather glue here is fine. Contact cement is also fine. We just want to hold it steady when we stitch it. I'm using my glue spreaders to get an even coverage. I'll clamp the trim piece and leave it to dry for a bit. Then I'll stitch the trim along the beveled line using a cylinder arm machine. You can of course stitch this by hand. I'm using some scraps of leather as a shield against the presser foot leaving impressions into the leather. After stitching I'll add a bit of extra shape to the trim piece. Note that I carved and beveled the stitch line prior to stitching to a pretty high degree. This will help conceal the stitch, and after it is stitched, I can burnish the bevels a bit to hide the stitch even more. Next I'll clamp the top visor piece to confirm its final location. Here's a quick hack. I'm misting some water over both pieces to get a quick reference of what's covered. Then I'll know where to rough out the leather to glue it. I'm not going completely to the edges though, as I want the edges of the leather details to float over the surface a bit, so I'm just roughing up the inner area that's going to be glued. <laughs> 
You can also ink a reference line where the top visor overlaps the base plate to see where to apply the glue there. I'll clamp everything up and leave it to dry. And then I'll carefully stitch inside the beveled lines. Now we can move ahead to the coloring process. You can certainly pick any color you want to dye or paint the piece, and the dye I'll be using for this project is Green Angelus Leather Dye. This is an alcohol-based dye that gives a vibrant base color, and I'll be using a technique called immersion dyeing for these parts. It uses a lot of dye, and it can be messy, but it is fast and deeply penetrating. And even though I'm going to paint it later, the good thing about dyeing a piece first like this with a similar base color is that if the paint gets scratched or damaged, which it eventually will, you'll reveal a similar color underneath which will make it not as obvious. Dye also actually helps firm up the leather, which is something we want for armor. Be sure to tend to the pieces as they dry when using the immersion method because they will often begin to sag. A little bit of deformation at this stage though is not really that bad. Just reshape them slightly back to their intended shape before they dry completely. For the finish we'll be using Weaver's Tough Coat. This is one of my go-to finishes, and I use the immersion technique here as well. I've had a couple of leather workers criticize this process, saying that I'm using more than I need to, but what they don't realize is that I'm deliberately using the acrylic as a hardener. There are various techniques to harden leather armor, but the reality is if you water form it and shape a piece of leather, that alone will start to firm it up a lot, but it won't retain its shape as well over time, and then it will firm up even more when you dye it, especially with an ample use of dye, and you'll start to lock in the shape. Then if you heavily seal it and let the acrylic absorb into the internal fibers of the leather, it becomes very hard, and yet still has some give, so it's not as prone to cracking or getting soft in the sun. This isn't the only process that I've used, it just ends up being a good balance. Using a blue shop towel is one of the ways I even out the finish. I'm being sure to let the side panel soak in a bit more, because these bits will stick out and they'll need to support their own weight over the long term. It's even more important at this stage to tinge your pieces as they dry, both to smooth the finish and also to manage the shape so that it doesn't collapse, because once it's dry at this point, it's very difficult to make any changes to the shape. You can do any last minute shape corrections or polish before things dry completely. I'm planishing the areas along the rivets to smooth the shape. I'll give the side plates a little bit of flair by shaping the feather details out. It's not a bad idea to reassemble the pieces at this point just to let everything dry in its intended shape. Painting. If you're happy with the dye alone, you can stop here. I think the extra effort of painting it will be worth it. So that's my next step. For this build, I'll be using a combination of some of my favorite acrylic paints from Jacquard. This metallic line of paints is called Blue Mirror. First, I'm using a sponge to apply a very light coat with metallic olive green. I want thin coats here because we'll be creating a lot of layers to build depth and texture, and we don't want to build up the paint too much in tooled areas, or have the paint end up being too thick. To add some initial antiquing, I'll use some black paint of Jacquard's Neopake, and a few drops to tint the black a little. I happen to have some brown airbrush paint from Createx Handy, 
I'll use a sponge that I've torn away some bits along the edge to give it a little bit of texture, and I'm dabbing it into the recessed tooled areas and along the edge to create a bit of a gradient. And I'm using rags to wipe off the surfaces, leaving behind the dark color in the recessed areas. You can follow this step up with a brush to increase the prominence of the gradient along the edges. I'm intentionally leaving a good bit of black texture behind throughout. Moving on, Ashley will be using Lumiere Metallic Bronze to paint the base layer of the first trim color. Next I'm going to airbrush some shading using Dirt Track Brown from Createx. My goal with this is to add a little bit of variation to the base layer and an additional slight gradient. And just for a bit of extra contrast to pop the trim, I'm using a finer brush to darken either side of the trim. I'll come back to the trim soon. Next I'm going to brighten the piece up. Here I'm using Lumiere Metallic Emerald Green. I'll be dabbing the paint on with a sponge to make it textured, and I'll prioritize the brighter areas of the gradient and the central features I want to emphasize. I don't want to completely cover up everything I've already done. Next I'm going to do a very light coat of green shimmer effect, just to add a subtle sparkle. I'll be applying a light coat of clear gloss from Createx. Sealers tend to reduce the luster of metallics, so to brighten the trim up again, Ashley will do a light dry brush press over the metallic bronze areas. And for the silver trim, she's using a paint from Molotov. 
looks really flat on the camera there. And now we get to bring it all together. If you put in the time to get the fit right in the pre-assembly stage, this will be a breeze. We'll start again with the tail assembly. I'm still using the medium double capture rivets. The dry pieces will be rather firm, so you may have to leverage them into place when they don't line up easily. Attaching the retaining strap will limit the range of motion. For any articulating sections, I'll always use Chicago screws, as this will allow the pieces to move freely. Just be sure to glue the threads when you're done. If you're finding this video interesting or informative, please consider liking the video and subscribing, and maybe share it with someone else you think would also like it. Next I'll move on to the comb. I'll use medium rivets when going through two layers of leather, and long rivets when going through three. If you're wondering about the horsehair tail, that's another area I'll be going over in the premium content included with the pattern bundle. And now finally we can mount the visor. You only need one Chicago screw on either side. This will allow the whole visor to completely hinge upward. If you feel like you're ready for the challenge, you can pick up the pattern bundle and the premium lessons for this project at the Prince Armory Academy. I even have a lot of free resources to get you going. However, I don't suggest you use this as your first leatherworking project. I spent the last few years building projects and content that gradually introduce new techniques, so I would suggest that you look at the Warrior, Fantasy, and Imperial Armor series, and those will be useful because this Elven series will assume you already have an understanding of the basics. To secure the faceplate when we don't want it to move, we'll add a snap on either side at the bottom. Thanks again to Weaver Leather for their support in this build. I've been purchasing supplies from them for nearly 20 years, and I can't recommend them enough. So if you need leather, hardware, and tools for your next build, please consider using my link in the description, and I'll receive a small commission on your order at no cost to you. Feel free to style the tail if you want. 
If you enjoyed this video, you can continue the Elven build in the next video seen here, or check out one of our previous builds seen here.